First, I'd like to invite the children, if you want to go downstairs, since it's Communion Sunday, you can start downstairs. We won't have a child in all of us. Um, if you are able, please rise for the call to worship. We have come to worship God, the living God, who calls God's people to bear witness. We have come to praise God, the almighty God, who answers the forces of hatred and hurt with the power of love. We have come to worship God, all gracious God, who invites you and me to choose love always. All glory to God. The first hymn is Come and Let Us Sweetly Join in the hymnal 699. Jesus Christ, the embodiment of love and Savior of all, and we respond to this God in love. We believe in the Holy Spirit, love's power poured out, and the presence of love within, and we respond to this God in love. We believe in the church, the community of love, and we believe in life new and eternal. Love enjoyed and shared with God and creation forever. And again, we dedicate ourselves to this love and to the God who gives it. Amen. Please be seated. The scripture from this morning, the first scripture is from Colossians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And the second scripture is from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8 through 13. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. 
but the greatest of these is love. God is still speaking. Yes, we are. So today I'm finishing up our what it means to be United Methodist. We have covered the history, how it began. We have covered what we believe. And then last Sunday we talked about what our mission is, why, why are we here for. And today I want to talk about what it means to be United Methodist. We are United Methodist, right? Not just Methodist Church. We are a churchy United. This is a question about the unity of the church. The unity of the church that Jesus himself established in the gospel. And the Paul talks about it in his letters all the time. In just over a week, 864 delegates from 135 annual conferences. If you have been here last three Sundays, you know what I'm talking about right? 864 representatives, half of them clergy, half of them lay, representing 12, over 12 million United Methodists all over the world, will be gathering as General Conference. General Conference is the only body that speaks on behalf of the whole church every four years. I talked to you, we're not a bishop, it's not, you know, some executives, that speaks for our church, conference speaks for our church. Collective discernment and decision is the one that is the official stance of the church that gathers every four years. We will gather. I'll be one of three clergies from our conference who will be there. For the last 40 years, since we became United Methodists after merging with two other denominations, Ten, annual, ten general conferences dealt with many different issues and petitions. They set the mission. But the underlying question about most of those petitions and debate and discussion is about the unity of the church. How do you understand the unity of church? What does it mean that we are united church? What does it mean for us to be one as Christ is one with God, as the gospel says. The idea and question about unity of church is not a new one because it is really about question about the, what is the boundary of the church? What is the boundary of God's people? What is the boundary of God's love, basically? Jesus had to engage in the question with Pharisees and scribes and high priests in Romans, when it comes to matters of Jews and Gentiles, the clean and unclean, you name it. The churches had to struggle with this idea. What is the boundary of God's people, the church, and God's love? When it comes to the matter of slavery, you learn that in the Methodist Church in 1800, in their you know, the general conference in 1800, they discerned that abolishing slavery was the will of God. But it took 1,800 years, but still. When it comes to the role of women, church struggled it. Do they belong to this boundary with the full rights or not? In the United States, the civil rights issues also have been debated and discerned. Race relations, all these things. Today's friend for this struggle, struggle about what it means to be United Methodist Church, what it means to have a unity of the church, is the issue around what United Methodists call human sexuality. On our social principle, there is a section 161 called human sexuality. Some people call it that's discrimination against LGBTQ folks. And this issue highlights church's struggle about the unity of the church. How same Christians can have different understanding about unity of the church. What it means to have unity of the church. What is the purpose of that unity? The first 
understanding of unity is a institutional understanding of the unity of the church. Having a unity of the church as an institution. This is a unity that creates a very clear boundary, who belongs, who don't belong, who are the members, who are not the members. Our current discipline describes homosexuality as incompatible with Christian teachings. There is one other area where our current stance says that is exclusively incompatible with Christian teaching, that is war. So homosexuality and war are the two practices that United Methodists right now officially believe non-Christian. And the unity based upon this stance is a unity that asks people to agree on one stance. It's a unity in which the truth is about clarity, the purity. It's a unity that asks the church to form this unity through agreement, through assent. So people, we are the people who have to agree to have a unity of the church, right? That's the institutional understanding and practice of unity of the church. The problem of this understanding is that the, this unity becomes the end in itself that justifies all other means toward it. See, the unity of church is itself is the purpose. That's why we have to agree. That's why we have to, you know, the, uh, uh, the exercise, the judgment, the trials, and we have to hold people accountable, all those things to maintain the unity. In that sense, this unity actually is what? Trying to get uniformity. The unity that denies and sometimes punishes the diversity for the sake of uniformity. Right now, if you are if you marry the same-sex couples or the ordain the LGBT folks, we will be held accountable depending on the process and lose our you know, licenses or get you know, punishment. That's unity what we have now as a church, at least according to the book. But we have to remember that whenever a church sought this institutional unity at all costs, only looking at inward, inwardly, the church did more harm than good. When Methodists, remember in the turn of the you know, century, in the early 1900s, Methodists, the fastest growing denomination in the US, ended up splitting into two. Methodist Episcopal Church in South and Methodist Episcopal Church in the North because they couldn't agree on abolition of slavery. The people who didn't agree that we should not abolish slavery, once for all, se split, separated out and created denomination. One of the main rationale of that split was that if we allow the abolition of slavery, it's gonna threaten the unity of the church. It's gonna upset people who owns slavery who were giving to the church, okay? It's gonna up that lot of white folks because we're gonna recognize African Americans at that time, the slaves' dignity. So it's gonna undermine the unity of the church. That was the rationale for this split. Thankfully, Methodist Church has come back together, declared it that was a wrong discernment, but that was the institutional unity that was used to maintain this stance at that time. There is a different kind of unity based, rooted in scripture. I call it, it's a missional unity. It's a unity that has a purpose. It's not a unity that is the end in itself. It's not about the church, it's about God. 
It is a tide of unity that frees us to be and to do what God calls us to be and to do. A unity that helps us to love God and love others as best as we can. That's what Jesus called his disciples and followers to be one. Jesus didn't call people to be one just so that they can be happy and be married together. Jesus called them to be one because if they love one another as Jesus have loved, that's going to you know, lay the foundation of that unity. So this is a unity that celebrates and expands the diversity. It's a unity that makes and calls the church to break boundaries. This is the kind of unity with which Jesus welcomed the Gentiles. This is the kind of unity that Jesus operated when he reached out and touched the lepers or blessed the sick. In this understanding of unity, truth is not about clarity. And we don't come to that truth by agreeing. In here, the truth is about love. And the way that we move toward that love, toward that unity, is understanding. Recognizing differences. And allowing people to be diverse. This is an important understanding because that's what we have right now. The, I told you, United Methodist Church is a global church. It had 135 annual conferences in all four continents. United Methodists, we are one, but with our own diverse background and cultural place and historical place, different understandings about scripture and theology. We are a diverse church. And developing an understanding of unity that can embrace diversity is at the heart of who we are as a global United Methodist Church. And it's a very personal matter to me, too. I think I'm not sure, I'm not sure whether I shared with you or not. I became a Christian. I became a Methodist. I became a Methodist clergy person because of one person, in a sense, my father. My father was a Methodist. He became a Methodist pastor. So I learned how to be a Christian, how to follow Jesus, mainly because of my father's examples, his preachings, his understanding, his theology. His influence is still on me. He died nine years ago. And three years prior to that, that was his last visit to me. He was visiting me every year. So we spent about a month together, and I was driving him from Concord, New Hampshire, to JFK in New York to drop him up at the airport. So we had five hours to kill. And, you know, uh, we got to talk about different things, and then we ended up talking about human sexuality or homosexuality. Because he got the word from other people that your son is out there and doing this sinful thing for advocating for homosexuals. So he gently asked me about, about it, and so we ended up talking about it for four hours. I've never talked with my father straight, even four minutes. I shared what I have come to believe, how I have become changed. All Koreans were, I was, you know, not into that place because in Korea, I've never heard the term homosexuality until I came here. That's how tabooed it was. It was just not accepted culturally, and in church, don't even mention it. It was not even an issue. That's how one-sided it was. So we ended up talking. I shared where I am. My father had a deep concern, but he respected me. But he shared where he was. We all agreed that the violence and the discrimination shouldn't be the way to respond to these folks. 
So we parted our ways. He left, and that was the last time that I talked with him consciously because he got immediately sick, and I couldn't communicate with him remainder of those three years, almost. So that was the last conversation. My father and I both love John Wesley. We are both Methodist. We agree probably on all issues, all theological, you know, matters, except this issue. According to our current understanding of unity, according to our book of discipline, according to our current stance, my father is right, I am wrong. We have a unity that puts a father from whom a, his son got everything about his faith in a one corner and his father in the different corner. That's the institutional unity that we have now. It puts the people who in the one side of issue, in this issue, on different corner than the people from different continent and different cultures. And they both saw each other as something lacking or not right. That's the unity that we have, dividing Christians into different places. So for the sake of unity, we are actually minimizing the unity, the boundary of God's people smaller. I don't doubt my father's faith. I don't think he's, he's, something, he's something lacking as a Christian. I don't think he doubts my faith. We just happen to disagree on one matter, one issue. Problem is not disagreement. Problem is stance that we have as a church that makes that disagreement as burden as a source of division, as a source of tension and confrontation, and not allowing for differences to exist together. Four years ago, we had a trial to simply say we disagree on this matter as a people, that we agree to disagree. It was voted down. It was not accepted by like 53 to 47. We cannot even agree on that because of one issue. Because we are holding on to institutional understanding of unity. But the Paul, today's scripture, is describing different kind of unity. It says in Colossians, which is a brand new church, Paul is concerned about these first Christians' unity. He's saying, therefore, as God's chosen one, Holy and dearly beloved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with one another. Forgive one another. As any of you has grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And here it is. And over all these virtues, put on love, which is the bond of perfect unity. What is perfect unity? Perfect unity is not a unity where people have to agree on all things. It's not about agreement. It's not about choosing one side or the other. Perfect unity is a calling. It's a gift from God that need to be lived out in our relationship with God and with all God's people. John Wesley we heard it in theology, believe that salvation is entire life, right? We are saved, we begin our sanctified life, and our sanctification will complete when God completes the history. We are the people who live in between those times. We are saved, we are united by God toward this consummation of God's you know, salvation called where God is trying to sanctify us, make us holy and sacred so that we can love God and love others even better, live deeper, a little wider. That's John Wesley's understanding of Christian life. That's why John Wesley said, 
to all opinions which do not strike at the root of Christianity. We think and let think. That's what he said. We think and let think. He had another famous line. He said, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. And in all things, charity. Hear it? In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. What we have as institutional unity right now, we are making non-essentials as an essential. Because it's not about love. Love is the essential. That's what St. Paul is describing in today's scripture. Did you hear it? It's a Eugene Peterson's paraphrase. Never, love never dies. Inspired speech will be over someday. Praying in tongues will end. Understanding will reach its limit. We know only a portion of the truth. And what we say about God is always incomplete. But when the complete arrives, our incompletes will be canceled. We don't yet see things clearly. We are squinting in a fog, peering through a mist. But it won't be long before the weather clears and the sun shines bright. We'll see it all then, see it all as clearly as God sees, knowing God directly just as God knows us. But for right now, now when we still see partially, now, we don't have, now, now when we don't have a complete truth, but for right now, until that completeness, we have three things to do to lead us toward that consummation, toward that Christian perfection, towards that truth. They are trust steadily in God, hope unswervingly, love extravagantly. And the best of three is love. Paul is saying the way that we achieve perfect unity is holding on to love. Love that allows people recognize that we only have partial truth. We are the people united to love God and love one another, not to agree or disagree, not to have one stance or not. When that difference is that vastly different. Someone said, some sociologist said, I don't understand United Methodist. I don't know how the United Methodist as an organization, as an institution, is going on while so many people are so passionately disagreeing on, on one matter. It's always 55 to 45. It's not like 90 to 10. I know why we are still going on, because we have still the people like, like all of you, we have people who still believe in this unity of God, still believe in love, bigger and deeper than issue or agreement. We are the people united to love God and love one another while we are being sanctified by God's grace toward that perfection. God has united us toward a purpose in a time when God's will is fully and perfectly completed. Until then, Paul is saying, all we have to care is about how we love one another. According to John Wesley's understanding of salvation, my God, my Father is not dead, right? According to the Gospel. I think my Father is still engaging in conversation with his heavenly Lord, in his place, going on to his own perfection, while I'm doing it on, my, on earth. I truly believe that someday when everything completes, my father and I will arrive in the same place, whatever that place, place may be. In the meantime, our disagreement doesn't affect the thing about my love for my dad and my dad's love for me. Steve Garner's Holmes, the pastor of St. Matthew's United Methodist Church in Acton, wrote this response to a letter that I wrote after the uh, 2012 General Conference. 
As a delegation chair, I have to write some response to what happened, basically saying that it is more important that we remain as a covenant people than what we have failed to do or was successful to do, one side one or the other. And he wrote this, which was a great truth for me. He said, we United Methodists will be known not for our decisions or our structure, but our love for each other. What unites us is not our shared opinions or even our similar faith, but our one Lord whose children, fractitious as we often are, are still members of one family, gathered at one table. We are not the people who agree. We are the people who come to the table. Perfect unity is not a unity through which we agree with one another. It is a uni unity in which we find each other as God's child to be loved and cherished. It is a unity that makes a church truly authentic and alive to God and to Jesus, whose body we are called to build together. You don't have to go to general conference to live out this unity. No matter our, you know, book of discipline says, you are the people of this unity because you will come to this table no matter where you are, whether you agree with one another or not. To that, thanks be to God, and thanks to God that we are indeed united Methodist. Let us stand and sing.